anatomy of the human shoulder joint, right? And the shoulder is an incredibly complex joint. It's my favorite joint, so I chose to specialize in it because of what it does. I mean, it's con the connection between your, you know, your extremity and your torso. It is the joint in the body that has the largest range of motion, which is incredible. It allows us to do so many of the things that make us human. Our, our shoulder joint is unique to all the other animals in the animal kingdom. And it's part of what allowed us to, you know, flourish as a species, right? Now, those, all those amazing things they can do come with trade-offs, right? And the trade-offs are, it is a, is a relatively fragile system that's easily to get disrupted. But let's just talk about the base anatomy. Well, you have, you know, your humerus comes up, okay? And it comes up in your proximal humerus, which is kind of the ball and socket of the shoulder. And then it comes into your glenoid, okay? So that's the socket. So you have the ball, which is the humeral head. You have the socket, which is the glenoid. And on top here, this bone here you feel is your acromion. That kind of runs along the top of your shoulder blade, and then it meets your collarbone. This meets right here, this is your AC joint. So the shoulder joint is actually kind of floating on your extremity because you have, you know, your, your collarbone comes up here to your sternoclavicular joint, it connects to your sternum. And then you have your shoulder blade that just sits on your chest wall, right? So those, that's the bony anatomy. You have your shoulder blade, which turns into your chromion, connects to your clavicle, and within your shoulder blade is the socket, the glenoid, and then the humeral head, which, which articulates there. The majority of the motion from the shoulder comes from the glenohumeral joint, that ball and socket. It's about 66% or two thirds. The other two thirds comes from the rotation of your scapula up your back. So your shoulder blade actually, when you elevate, that shoulder blade has to glide up your back in order for you to lift and use your arm. So it's, it's both joints. It's the scapula thoracic and the glenohumeral joint that allow motion of your shoulder. I'm talking about the muscles of the shoulder, right? So there's actually 17 muscles that come across the shoulder, but we'll talk about the big ones. You know, the big one you feel right here is your deltoid muscle, right? That's, that's what, that's the big mover. That's the engine. That's the motor that drives everything, right? Deep inside the shoulder, you have the rotator cuff, which is a group of four muscles, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor, right? Those are the rotational muscles that keep the ball and socket in play, right? So are they, they, they keep them stable, right? Like think about it, it's, it's, a, it's a group of four muscles that encompass the shoulder that keep everything stabilized. And they, they tend to tear a lot across our lives and wear and tear. And that's one of the, the biggest parts of my practice is dealing with pathology of the rotator cuff because the pathology is, it's so common for people to have problems with their rotator cuff, whether it be tendonized or tears. And when it does tear, it causes a lot of issues because the ball and socket's not stable. Deep inside the shoulder, you have, you know, your labrum and the capsule, which can be, you know, you hear about labral tears. That's another thing to help stabilize the shoulder. You have your long head biceps, which your biceps is called biceps because bi is two, it's Latin for two. And it travels up in here. The, there's a short head, which inserts onto your coracoid. And then the long head, which travels right through, actually right between two rotator cuff muscles, subscapularis and supraspinatus to insert at the top of the glenoid. We think of the biceps almost as like the appendix of the shoulder in some you know ways, because you know, when you rupture your long head biceps or we cut it and move it, it doesn't really change a lot with the function of your shoulder. Now, we're starting to maybe kind of backtrack on that a little bit, that it does maybe impart some stability of the shoulder. So for me, with some of my rotator cuff repairs, I won't cut the biceps and move it anymore. I'll use it. It's kind of a case by case basis. But in general, the long head biceps, it comes through the shoulder, inserts at the top of the glenoid, and it, it does impart some stability on the shoulder for sure. And it, it, it does become pathologic and cause pain in a lot of people, right? Other muscles, you know, you've got your, your lat, which is right here, which inserts is in the front. Uh, it's an internal rotator and an AD ductor. And you have your pec, which comes across here. You have your pec minor, which goes from coracoid to your chest wall. That can get tight and cause pathology. You know, you have your trapezius muscle up here, which is a shrugger of your shoulder. You have your, your rhomboids and then your trapezius and your low trap, which helps help elevate the scapula. Your serratus anterior is a group of muscles here that keep your shoulder blades flat up against the wall. So you always want to have those serratus muscles nice and strong so your, your shoulder blades don't wing out. It gives you some stability there. You have your teres major, which is sort of like your lat. It's, it comes across here. It's an internal rotator and AD ducts the arm down. Um, those are some of the main muscles that I think about around your shoulder. There's, there's other little small ones that don't impart a ton of stability or you know, they don't cause a lot of problems, so we don't just, we don't talk about them that much. But those are, those are the main muscles of the shoulders that we're, we're thinking about. And then in terms of the variations in your shoulder, everybody is very unique. It's incredible, right? Like the, the variations in human anatomy are, it's, it's astounding, you know, how big we are, how small some people are, or skinny or large, or all the different things we see. In general, in the shoulder, what you see in terms of, it's not just the anatomy, it's people's, it's people's physiology, right? Some people go their whole life without tearing their rotator cuff, 
right? Some people, their rotator cuff starts to tear in their thirties. That's a physiology thing. That's how you're, that's what's in your DNA. That's what you're, the, the, the substance of your body. And some people just like, I, I tell patients, like you see some people where they go bald when they're 21 or their hair turns gray when they're 25 or kids with glasses. Well, like things in their body is just wearing out faster. No different than the shoulders. So I think the biggest variation is how quickly things wear out. Some people get arthritic, like they start to lose the cartilage in their shoulder and, and people always want to blame themselves. It's like, oh, it's because I did this or this. It's really your genetics, honestly. Now, some of the things you do do influence it, but it's mostly, it's a lot of it's genetics. It's in the cards, right? You know, we used to think that there's, you know, the acromion comes over and your rotator cuff comes right underneath it. And the people talk about a bone spur there causing a rotator cuff tear. That is old thinking. That's thinking from the eighties and seventies. The newer, more contemporary thought on rotator cuff tears is that the tendon just wears out and tears, and then a bone spur gets created from the tear, okay, because you get impingement between your humerus and your acromion right here, and when those bones rub, they cause a spur, right? So we smooth that down during rotator cuff surgery just to take some some of the pressure off the cuff, but that's a variation you see, you know, how tight is that space, but in, in general, that's not really what's causing the cuff tear. It's more the, the again, like we talked about, the, the difference in physiology of the patient. The other variation, a big variation you see is the instability of someone's shoulders. Some people have shoulders that are, they're born with some instability and that can become pathologic across their life where the ball doesn't want to stay on the socket. That's a big thing we see. And then the other you know variation you would see is just, again, the, the, the physiology where people's joints wear out, right? Everybody's born with a set of tires. Some people's tires wear out faster than others. And you know, when your shoulder tire wears out, you're losing cartilage and you become arthritic and that's very painful. So those would be the main variations that I see in anatomy. There's a lot of other little subtle nuanced things. And you know, I've been taking videos of my arthroscopy since the beginning of my practice. You know, you'll put a scope in someone's shoulder and you'll see like a biceps tendon that's like bifid or part of the, you see some really weird stuff occasionally, otherwise it wouldn't be weird, right? Uh, but the big variations I see are really in instability of the shoulder. Some people are born with shoulders that are unstable. And then, you know, some people are born with rotator cuffs that wear out sooner than others. And people have joints that wear out sooner than others.